Your forecast first on Local 22 News. Good evening. Breaks of blue sky becoming more numerous as we get ready to close out our Thursday. A lot of the day spent under stubborn cloud cover, but with some really beneficial rain. Localized totals exceeding an inch in a lot of spots, but widespread a good quarter to three quarters of an inch. Half an inch in Plattsburgh and Middlebury just about seven tenths of an inch in Bennington, around eight tenths of an inch for Springfield, three tenths of an inch in Montpelier. Last showers are moving out of here in the next couple of hours. We'll be long gone. We just have a handful through southern Vermont and southern New Hampshire. Hampshire. Then we're diving head first right back into another stretch of sunny, dry, and fairly hot weather. We'll talk top temps for the weekend in your forecast. Local 22 News starts now. This is Local 22 News at 7. Tonight at 7, we begin with the latest coronavirus numbers in our area. 11 new cases have been reported in the Green Mountain State, 10 in Chittenden County, and one in Windsor County. Meanwhile, in the Granite State, 25 new cases tonight bringing the state total to 6,313. Three people have died. They were all at least 60 years old and from Hillsborough County. Meanwhile, in New York's North Country, no new patients in Essex County. Jay Peak says the last of the remaining foreign ski workers who have been stranded at the resort since the pandemic began are on their way home to Peru. Melissa Sheffer, Jay Peak's director of rooms and community engagement, said in an email that the resort has been providing them food, free accommodations, trips to the store, health checks, hiking trips, and a canoe outing. The resort took the five college students to Boston on Wednesday and flew them out to Miami. By Thursday morning, they were on a plane to Lima. Shepard says a sixth student has her visa extended. According to the U.S. Ski Areas Association, American ski resorts employ about 7,500 J-1 visa holders each year. Good evening and thanks for being here. I'm Devin Bates filling in for Lauren Maloney tonight. The city of Burlington may take legal action amid reports of Brookfield properties attempting to abandon the city place project. Local 22's Jolie Sherman has more on the situation from a legal standpoint. Lots of contention related to the area behind me as Brookfield Properties is now backing out of a commitment to bring more businesses and life to this area. Now the city of Burlington is considering taking legal action. Vermont Law School's assistant professor Jared Carter says the city's argument against Brookfield is twofold. Number one, that Brookfield breached its contractual obligations to the city. Um, and number two, that they acted fraudulently in terms of representing that they had the financing in place. But Carter says these legal claims may be difficult to make as the city would have to prove Brookfield knowingly and intentionally misrepresented the facts. He anticipates Brookfield will use the defense of impossibility that there was no way they could have fulfilled its contractual obligation. So in this case, I would anticipate Brookfield will argue we could not get financing. We engage in due diligence to get it, but we just couldn't get it. Carter says they may even bring up other scenarios. Uh, and I could see them talking about COVID-19, all of the uncertainty around that. Are we going to need offices downtown? In the future, the city could argue the power of eminent domain in which it can claim private property for public use. There's no doubt in my mind that the city has the power to use that uh, quote unquote against the developer if if it wanted to. One Vermonter moved her business across from the development before the project began. She told me she was excited at first, but that soon changed. My clients were kind of a little frustrated on the lack of parking downtown now. Um, between losing the garage and the street parking over here as well. Allegedly, the project may be handed over to developer Don Sinex, who's already been in charge of it once before. When asked for a response, he said he may have a statement in the coming weeks. There is just a little bit of development going on. Construction crews are putting in new parking spaces to make this area more walkable for the time being. In Burlington, Jolie Sherman, Local 22 News. Thank you, Jolie. A New York man who was hospitalized for nearly four months with COVID-19 is now back home. Family and loved ones now call him Miracle Larry. Jenna DeAngelis reports. On his feet again, walking out of a medical facility for the first time since March, Larry Kelly was surrounded with so much love.
An emotional embrace from his wife, his daughter wiping away tears, an unforgettable moment after months in New York City hospitals fighting for his life. It's 128 days. That's why they call him Miracle Larry. I've got to believe that it's my own willpower and, and, and all of their support. You know, I, I believe that in my bones. The 64-year-old retired high school assistant principal was first hospitalized with COVID-19 on March 17th on a ventilator for 51 days. At one point, his family was called to the hospital to say goodbye, but he didn't give up and neither did they. It gets tough. You, you kind of have to hold on to as much hope as you can. My wife saved my life. She wouldn't let them pull the plug. For months, his wife holding on to the words on this sign, the last words her husband texted her before he was put on a ventilator. I said, I promise I'll never stop fighting. And, uh, I kept my promise. He sure did. Opening his eyes Easter Sunday to so much support, especially his sister says from medical staff. You can't see your family for 128 days. They became his family. I will forever, forever be indebted to those people. Larry said the first thing that gave him hope was knowing this sign was here at his favorite bar, Dive Bar at 96th Street. So on his journey Wednesday from the new Jewish home to his Upper West Side home, he had to stop and see that sign in person. That was the first indication that I existed. I was so moved that you put that sign up. Without regulars, without people like Larry, we don't exist. So he's part of our family. I couldn't even sleep last night because I was so excited about today. Nobody more excited than Larry, looking forward to his first meal. I don't know if you've ever had nursing home food, but... <laughs> Sharing laughs, tears, and important messages. I wouldn't wish this on anybody, though. So please wear your mask. Never stop fighting. No matter how tough life gets, you know, don't give up. Because he didn't give up, 128 days later, he's a survivor going home. Jenna DeAngelis, CBS 2 News. As Congress negotiates additional stimulus due to the coronavirus, Governor Andrew Cuomo and county leaders in New York continue to plead for aid to states and localities. Karina Capabianca has more on what they're asking for. It's very simple. If they want to get this economy back running, you have to fund state and local governments. Yesterday, Governor Cuomo and Maryland Governor Larry Hogan published a statement on the National Governors Association website, again asking for a $500 billion state stabilization fund. Meanwhile, local leaders also continue to push for federal aid. Albany County Executive Dan McCoy says with indicators like a high unemployment rate, sales tax revenue down, and lower hotel occupancy rates. We could be looking at shortfall anywhere from 40 to $60 million by the end of this year. The state is currently facing an estimated $13 billion budget shortfall, which could amount to $61 billion over the course of four years. The governor has said if the federal government doesn't act, there could be 20% across the board cuts to local governments, schools, and hospitals. A lot of people have lost a lot. Uh, and uh, businesses uh, uh, may never open again. Employees may never return to a job again. Don't compound that problem. Uh, don't force us into the position of eliminating core services. The governor also says that annually New York gives $29 billion more to the federal government than it receives. In Albany, Karina Capabianca. Well, good news for all the Swifties out there. You know they've been waiting. Coming up, how the pop superstar is surprising fans with a secret album she made while quarantining. And get this, returning to the ring after over a decade away, who Mike Tyson is slated to face off against when he makes his comeback. And aside from just a few showers that still have to move out, it's turning into a nice evening. This weekend promises a lot more of that right there, the sun, and a little bit more heat too. Maybe talking 90s in the forecast. You're watching local news that matters with Lauren Maloney and SkyTracker Chief Meteorologist Amanda Tebow. This is Local 22 News at 7.
local news that matters on Local 22 News. Well, if you need a little quarantine cheer, don't worry. Taylor Swift is here to help. With a new surprise album release, it's called Folklore, and Swift says she wrote and recorded the entire album while in isolation, but admits she had help from some co-writers. The pop superstar announced the release on Twitter, writing, quote, Most of the things I had planned this summer didn't end up happening, but there's something I hadn't planned on that did happen. Swift says she'll premiere the music video for Cardigan, one of her new songs, tonight, so that should be popping up any minute now. Well, lifestyle diva Martha Stewart is burning up the internet with a selfie of her cooling off. The 78-year-old posted this shot from her pool in Bedford, New York. Followers went nuts over Stewart's glowing skin. She kept the post focused on her 30-year-old pool, but it comes as Stewart launches a new show on HGTV. The series Martha Knows Best premieres this month. It focuses on her completing outdoor projects around her Bedford farm. And after 15 years, like boxing legend Goliath. Mike Tyson is getting ready to Most get back know, into the ring. The 54-year-old former heavyweight champion of the shit, world look. will face off with Roy Jones Jr. in an eight-round exhibition bout. Jones Jr. is a former four-division world champion who sported a 66-9 and nine record. The pay-per-view fight is branded as the, quote, frontline battle. It's now set for September 12th at Dignity Health Sports Park in Carson, California. The Civilian Conservation Corps turned the Groton State Forest into what it is today. Coming up, we get to see their work at this place in history. And we're heating back up as we get into the weekend. 90s possible again with Sunday's front holding off until Sunday night now. All right, all the details on the heat next. Local news that matters on Local 22 News. Now, your Sky Tracker forecast with Chief Meteorologist Amanda Tebow. Most of us are in the 70s this evening with increasing breaks of blue sky and sun as we finally get past this midweek cloud cover and this midweek rain as well, which really proved beneficial in a lot of spots. I mean, we saw some localized totals exceed an inch, but widespread, a good tenth up to eight tenths of an inch through the region. 78 right now in Plattsburgh. It is 79 degrees in Burlington, Montpelier, you're at 76. We've got 73 for you in Newport and Middlebury. Rutland, you're stepping out to 70, 71 in Springfield. Some rain cool there in those spots, but 79 in Bennington and 77 degrees in Lebanon. The last of our showers are on their way out, so we're at the very 
very tail end of this midweek rain. And the boundary that brought us the rain today is then not followed up by another one until Sunday night into Monday. That's a change from yesterday. So all week long, it was looking like that front was going to arrive sometime in the afternoon on Sunday with the front getting hung up to the north. That means we've got more time to heat up through this upcoming weekend. So the 90s are possible now. Connecticut River Valley, we've got some more rain for you in and around Springfield to Rockingham here. We also have some rain just south of Haverhill. So we're cruising by from west to east, approaching I-93, some of the heavier stuff from Lincoln to Plymouth. So this, the end of it for central portions of our region, but we've got another few showers to go to sneak into southern Vermont and southern New Hampshire. If we fast forward though to about eight, nine o'clock, there it is. That's our end time. Chance you find any rain after that. Very slim. The sky will be clearing, so we'll call it a partly cloudy night. And we have some patchy fog developing in areas that picked up rain by daybreak tomorrow with morning temps in the mid-60s for broad valleys. But some of our cooler terrain like the Kingdom or the Adirondacks could bottom out and being nice and comfy mid to upper 50s. Tomorrow's a gorgeous day. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Out of those three days, we know they're all going to be dry. I would pick Friday as the best day to spend a lot of time outdoors, and that's for a few reasons. Friday has a light north wind at 5 to 10 miles per hour. That north northwesterly wind helps to keep the humidity at bay a bit. It is a little muggy, but it's not terrible. And it's our coolest of the three days, and we're still well into the 80s. So the warm up really starts tomorrow, but if you want to avoid being out in the 90, 92 degree heat, tomorrow is the day to get any of your outdoor work done. Saturday, clouds will increase on us. So we'll start sunny, but clouds are going to trickle in as the day goes on, and that boundary gets closer and closer coming at us from the north. But rain's going to hold off through most of Sunday, not arriving until around dinner time. Chance for showers and thunderstorms then continues from Sunday night into Monday and Tuesday. So it's a bit of an active, soggy start to next week. We don't have to wait for the middle of the week for the rain to arrive. You'll notice the rain will take us away from those near 90 degree temps too, but we will come close to another heat wave. This forecast can be found online at mychamplainvalley.com. So if you miss it here on air, log on and click the word weather. I almost started sweating a little bit when I heard you say the coolest day of this weekend is going to be 85 <laughs> degrees. Right. <laughs> I can't wait for those weekends when it's, you know, sunny, 70 degrees, but we'll get there. I mean, you can't really complain about the good weather like that. That's true. We'll get there. And, you know, if you think about February or early March, these are the kind of weekends that a lot of people look forward to, the heat. So it's all about perspective. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Local news that matters on Local 22 News. Local news that matters on Local 22 News. At this place in history, we're in one of my favorite spots in the state. It's the Groton State Forest on top of Owl's Head Mountain, joined by, of course, Executive Director of the Vermont Historical Society, Steve Perkins. Steve, what brings us out here today? Well, I guess, Amanda, I am so happy to be out again <laughs> doing these spots, so really excited about that. 
also one of my favorite spots in Vermont. And we're going to be talking about the Civilian Conservation Corps, part of the Works Progress Administration that helped turn this into kind of a, a blasted landscape of no trees, if you can imagine, into the park that we know today. So I noticed when we were walking up here, the trail was just perfect. You had nice little step stones to walk up. Was that the Civilian Conservation Corps? It was. And, you know, you can see um, like little huts and lean-tos and things. They built those. But, you know, we feel it's part of the landscape now. They're not. Those are constructed. And they were constructed by people just working with their hands. We're on the side of a mountain right now. They didn't get any equipment up here. So it was all done with hand tools, moving those stones, moving those trails. A really important project, both for Vermont, but also for our country. It put thousands of young men to work during the Great Depression and gave us a, an, an infrastructure for this state um, that we really needed. It makes the spot really accessible for people who may not be able to go on a four or five hour trek through the woods to find a view like this. I have to wonder, before the CCC, were people out here camping and recreating? They were, and it was mostly locals and probably, you know, the end of the uh, end of the 19th century, so we're talking like the 1890s, folks started to take more leisure time. They could get on the lumber train and have have a, a what's called a whistle stop so they could get off and they, they got off at the foot of Lake Groton and then they could walk through which was essentially a, a swamp but it was fairly s flat to docks there and spend summers on this lake and th they didn't have camps in the way we think of you know these cabins that we have today often they were tents built on tent platforms people would spend the summer fishing um, or boating on these remote ponds and then usually the men would come back later in the fall um, and hunt but still hard to get to. You had to take the train, you had to hike in, you had to carry everything in. The, the work of the CCC really opened it up to a lot more people. I mean, another thing that the CCC did right here in Groton was build the forest road. So the state forest road, which goes from Route 2 to Route 302, right through the middle of the forest, there was no road here. The CCC built that. I think if you want to see kind of in one tight spot evidence of the CCC, Groton State Forest is a great place to come. You can even go down to Osmore Pond, which is part of the forest, and see the remnants of the camp. So these folks lived on site where they worked for, for a couple of years, so they built barracks or tent cities that they lived in. Now I know everyone watching this is planning their summer or fall picnic in this very spot because it's so beautiful. How can they learn more about the history of the Ground State Forest before coming here? I would encourage you to go to our website, vermonthistory.org, and we have a page called History Outdoors. So during the summer when you want to be outside, it's got tours all over the state and there's a link to the history guide to Groton State Forest. So you can pick it up right there at this place in history. Well, a day to remember the wonderful woman we call Grandma, Nana, G-Mama, Noni, and Granny. Whatever you call them, we all love them. Coming up next, a tribute to our favorite matriarchs on gorgeous Grandma Day. Local news that matters on Local 22 News. Coming up, the new concern is it possible to get COVID-19 twice? The troubling new reports, Inside Edition, after the news.
Local news that matters on Local 22 News. Well, the smell of tea, stories of worldly travel, and a lifetime of wisdom. We are, of course, talking about grandmas. Who doesn't love a grandma? There are all sorts of grandmothers out there, and Local 22 is celebrating them tonight with some pictures of the lovely grandmothers of some of our staff members. Now, your grandma might ride a motorcycle and listen to heavy metal. I can tell you mine definitely doesn't. And she may have a cell phone better than yours. Heck, she may not even be your actual grandmother. Some nanas are just women who know to make an effort and spend time with the younger generations. No matter who they are, what they like, or even if they are your biological grandmothers, all grandmas are gorgeous. Make sure to tell the ones in your life how much you appreciate them. Grannies are precious. And right at the end there, we are seeing some photos of my grandparents. There they are at their oh, wow. 1960s wedding. <laughs> and that was a New Year's Eve wedding. Sadly, they have both passed away, but it's great to have this opportunity to remember them. And I'm sure they would be psyched to know that they are live on the air in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, so once again, we all love our grandparents. If you have anybody in your life that uh, you maybe haven't checked up on in a while, it's always good to keep in touch with your grandparents, especially at a time like this where we're living in right now. It sure is. I had to cancel a trip to go see my grandparents in Florida. I haven't seen them in a year and a half, so there have definitely been some extra phone calls. Uh, I feel like all grandparents live in Florida. You know, what I mean? <laughs> my grandma moved to Florida a few years ago, and she loves it down there. But yeah. yeah. They moved when my dad was 11, so they've been there a long time. I won't say how many years, because my dad will get mad at me. But <laughs> And even hotter in Florida than it is here yeah. coming up for this weekend. Looks like a, a little bit Florida-like, though, here up in mm -hmm. Vermont. Yeah, absolutely. Another Miami kind of weekend for us. The humidity is back, and the temps are moving to the 90s. A few showers are wrapping up this evening in southern Vermont and southern New Hampshire, but once those are out of here, you got the all clear. All right. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you here tomorrow night at 7 o'clock.